Oh, you want to? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, this is Tom Gallo. Uh, Cole Jeffsmer. This is for Dr. Will's Axe 298, investigating the case of George Banks. The, um, George Banks was the, what was the highest mass murder in Pennsylvania state history. Killed um, what was it, 12 people. 12 counts of first degree murder, one count of third degree murder. One account of attempted murder, aggravated assault, recklessly endangering another person, robbery, theft of a motor vehicle as well. All right, so let's just get into the case here. So we start here on September 24th, 1982. Around 9 o'clock, Banks is attempt, uh, attending a, a birthday party at the Galbraith residence, a friend of, fr friend of the appellant. Mm -hmm. Um Residence for Stanley O'Brien, his birthday party. I don't know how old he was, how old he's turning, but it's here in Wilkes-Barre. So he arrives there around 9 and 9.30 at night with his girlfriend, Dorothy Lyons, who is 29, and his mm -hmm. other girlfriend, Regina Clemens. So this guy has got a lot of girlfriends, a couple of them. So he's drinking beer, having a great time. Now, big... One of the bigger things that happened that was actually stated in the trial was that he exchanged a shirt with a Sharon Gome. Shirt said, kill them all and let God sort it out. I'm sure no one really thought about it at the time. No. But then once he starts actually shooting people, he's like... Yeah, no, he like, um, went and started shooting people. He wore it underneath his um, army gear, everything that he had in his house. Yeah. So that was kind of strange. Uh, but anyway... So many, many people at the party testified uh, at his trial that his speech was normal along with his movements. Despite drinking beer for about an hour. Yeah. You know, he wasn't there at the party for long, so he leaves at like 10.30 with his girlfriend, Regina. Uh, by the time he gets home at the famous 28th Schoolhouse Lane, he, he takes Delantin, anti-epileptic drug, end up being important later in the case and some gin so he's taken some pretty powerful stuff yeah down in it with some alcohol and passes out 10 30 and wakes up way that morning on 7 and no he wakes up at 12 he he wakes Jesus. up at 12 in the morning 12 in the morning 12 in the morning he doesn't even get a full night's rest so now we're into september 25th bank calls the house the Galbraith house, and asks for Dorothy, his, his other girlfriend that's still at the party. She asks uh, the owner of the house, David, which is actually her nephew, to get his AR-15 that he's been keeping there for a couple weeks. So it seems like he's he was planning this. Yeah, plan, definitely planning on something. wasn't um like a insanity thing, like, uh, like a passion thing. Definitely... Definitely was planning it. Definitely was planning it. And it, you think someone would have said something about it. Like, why, why do you want yeah. me to have your gun here? He hasn't had it in so long, and randomly he just wants I, to take it and everything. Yeah, after what seemed like a good night, a good party. I mean, I wasn't there, but... <laughs> anyway, so Lyons takes the gun, leaves the party, and around 1 a.m. with uh, Susan Uhas in the car, which actually... I believe was one of his other girlfriends. Yes. So he's <laughs> got we're up to three three girlfriends. Um that's not weird or anything, right? Alright, so about one fifteen. Kenneth Scott, a resident of an apartment complex where um Dorothy lived, saw banks with th with a bag of small boxes, which we now believe to be ammo. Yeah, definitely. Right. So we can believe that he was keeping ammo at her apartment, drove yeah. there himself, um, and got it. That seems like another yeah. another point of planning because it's not in his own house. And yeah, and spreading the evidence he's out, spreading everything away. Kind of ammo's here, guns here, which yeah. is already weird. Which makes me think like. He already had like a bit of an issue. He didn't trust himself, I think. Yeah. To have that around. Maybe him. he didn't trust his own record, or yeah, you know, he knew he was being watched or yeah, something. Um. 
So another another thing that was weird at that same moment, Scott called out to him. I don't know, I don't know what he said exactly, but he's probably like, oh, George, what's up? You yeah, know? what's going on? And George responds, you ought to be careful yelling at someone like that. You get yourself shot. So imagine being so, like the guy. And he's yeah. like, whoa, I thought we yeah, were friends. Man. Yeah, definitely. Um, just seeing you around that. A little aggressive, I'd say, probably from the alcohol and maybe. Yeah. Right. But still, you say that, but when he when when Kenneth testified at the trial, he said that he was understandable and his speech was normal, his walking was normal. So, you know, that's that's where there's a toss up here whether this guy was really all there or not. Yeah. Right. This is where. So now, two a.m. So not even an hour has passed by. Mm -hmm. Four teenagers are walking out of the friend's house. On Schoolhouse Lane, just down the street from where he lives. Yep. And they report they heard gunshots coming from the house. Presumably that his mm -hmm. house. Um, so the teenagers are Raymond Hall, James Olson, Tommy DeLemer, and Molly McBride. Okay, so they're probably walking out of a friend's house. Banks walks outside, like with, with what you said, his army fatigues, yep. his shirt on, his AR-15. Yep. Hall calls out, I know you, recognizing Banks, because I'm sure, you know, it's his friend's house. He's probably yeah, seen him there. Definitely. And he call, and he responds, yeah, you're not going to live to tell anybody about this. Shoots him. Shoots him right there. Shot him fatally. Hall and Olsen. Hall dies on the scene. Mm -hmm. But Olsen is is injured, but he, he, mm -hmm. he survives. Yeah, he survives. So he, and he testifies and... Um, Delima and McBride, they find cover and they eventually call the police. Yeah. Um, so at that time, the shots that they heard, Banks shot eight of his family members in his house, both women and children. Yep. So the victims are Susan Uhas, 23 years old, girlfriend and wife, or I don't really know what the legal title was. Yeah. Um, his his four year old child, uh, Bowendy Banks, and his one year old child, Maritania Banks. Um, they both lived with Banks. Those the two kids and the girlfriend. Um, he also killed Dorothy Lyons, twenty nine, the one that brought him the gun. Um, his child. Four round banks, uh, one year old, and Nancy Lyons, which is not the child um, of Banks, but the daughter yeah. of Dorothy. Also, Regina Clemens, age 29, and Montezema Banks, uh, age six, also a child of Banks. Um, they didn't live with Banks at the time, but two weeks prior to that, they moved out. Mm -hmm. And they planned on leaving the state, which we find out later from the sister. Um, so now, after all this happens, 2.10 a.m. So all this happened in within the span of about, let's say, 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay? This is when he leaves and goes This down. is when he leaves. Yeah. This is when he okay. steals a car. Um, he says to the guy... Move over, I'll blow your, your effing head off. Yes. Okay? After he drives around for a little bit, he allows him to get out. And he said he'd leave it where he could found it. It'd be found later, the next day, with bullets and Bullet. gin and... <sighs> anything. Oh, think of. Anything, that, <laughs> anything that can incriminate this guy in the car. Okay? 2.30 in the morning now. Uh, police got reports of shots fired at... Heather Highlands Trailer Park in Jenkins Township, which is just about, I don't know, 10 minutes up. Yeah, 10 minutes, 10 minutes away yeah. from Wilkes Bear. Um, so the report was that they heard gun, people heard gunshots and they heard a man shouting, and that's, that's what you get for effing with me. You F with me and some more, and I'll come back and kill the rest of you. Okay, so this guy's on a, a complete rampage at this yeah, point. He's. On a rage. And He's on a rage. Yes. Without a doubt. That's what we're classifying this as. Um, so, 
found dead was another former girlfriend, Sharon Mazzaleo, age 24. Kishimayu Banks, age 5. Child, another another one of these. Yeah, he has a lot of children. Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if this guy can't control himself or what. I uh, killed the mother, too, Alice Mazzaleo, 47. And Scott Mazzaleo, age 7. Sharon, her nephew. Um, so, the witnesses, uh, Angela Vidal and the brother, Keith Mazzaleo, they, uh, they were both alive, and Banks told him that he'd come back. He'd come back, in. but thankfully, he never does. He never does. All right, so 6 a.m. now. Not really sure what happens in the, between, you know, 2.30, 3 a.m., 6, 6 a.m., it was Whether he... unclear of what he did. There was no trace of him of being anywhere else, honestly, other than those two locations. Yeah, I mean, so. maybe he walked back or drove back, but who he knows? May have passed out in the car, possibly. We yeah. Don't... Maybe drank more alcohol. We don't know. Um, 6 a.m., Banks arrives at his mother's house, Mary Ellen, and walks in. He's saying, I killed them. I killed them all. I guess referring to his family and his kids. Yeah. Um, so, but police established contact with him from Schoolhouse Lane, and they were they said that he had a normal, controlled voice, and even when they were trying to convince him that his kids were still alive, he still knew that they were dead. Mm-hmm. You know, which is kind of going against the whole insanity thing. Yeah. Well, and another thing was that when we get into the core part, we have that he took pictures of them dead. That's new. Yes. Where are we at? We'll get into that in a minute. Um, so, at that time, then Banks asked his mother to drive him to his friend's house, 24 Monroe Street, and prepared for a siege. Which is where he boarded up the whole entire house. <laughs> the whole house um, boarded up. Uh, windows, the front door especially, obviously the back door, all the back windows... And this is where he had a four-hour standoff with police, um, which this is where the weird part comes in with the children, with the children knowing that the kids are dead, but the police are telling him over the phone call that they are alive and that they need blood for him to give himself up. Yeah, he knew he knew that they were dead, and he didn't he didn't want them to grow up in a race as well. That's what he kept saying. Yeah just kept saying that he didn't want them to grow up in a racist world and you know he'd rather have them be dead basically yes ended now like yeah basically because being him being biracial he dealt with a lot of racism and everything that he went through he didn't want his kids to go through this at the same point right so this whole standoff starts at 8 a.m and goes all the way to 11 15 um in the morning um, so afterwards, all the people that spoke with Banks that morning testified that they had no trouble understanding him. He answered all the questions calmly and responsibly and responded to instructions. He had, but he had an odor of alcohol in common, which, you know, which is strange because if, I mean, you shouldn't be able to, I don't know what I'm getting at. <laughs> all right anyway so he pleads insanity at trial and lay testimony and expert testimony both for his defense they both oppose completely with the prosecution yeah um I mean, sanity never even had a chance considering yeah. no he was drinking uh, like with insanity, it's obviously like a sporadic emotion, like a sudden thing. Like happens in a split second, like the, like the snap of a finger. Yeah. And this happened. He planned this out. You know, getting the AR-15. He got the ammo. Yeah. He he drove around. He had time to drive. Which the drive from what was it, Schoolhouse Lane to Monroe Street is about fifteen minutes. I think. Yeah. I think that's what we um looked into. But that's where insanity plea just wouldn't work. I mean, yeah. it wasn't sporadic. He did this over a course of time, like we said. And 
it would have had to been in, with under a minute all this happened. But exactly. It happened way, way too long over time for it to be an insanity yeah. plea. And the prosecution, that was that was pretty much their case. You know, they said that there was evidence of premeditation and planning. The phone call to Dorothy Lyons about getting the AR-15. Yep. That's evidence. Driving to get the ammo. That's evidence. And another thing that they, uh, they used to uh, convict them was evidence of malice, which is the intention to do evil. Right? So they, the, what they used in the case is saying that they shot, he shot all of them in the head. All the kids, all, of his, all the people that he shot were all shot in the head. And in a case that they, they go back to in the trial, uh, Commonwealth versus Roberts, they define malice um, as pointing a deadly weapon directed, directing the deadly weapon at a vital part of the body, mm-hmm. which would be the head. Yep. Right. So, but let's let's get into why or what we know basically yeah. about this guy and why he would have done this. Yeah. Get into his what his, was his background, his psyche. Whatever yep. you want to call it, we can get into it. So we can get into like his first violent crime. Um, he had it was a shooting of an unarmed tavern keeper during the robbery. Um, he was sentenced six to fifteen years in prison, but then was hit with additional time for escaping in nineteen sixty four. Wow, this guy's a, that seems to be an expert. Yeah, that's why it's like escaping prison, but. So clearly, this man is beyond smart. He's yeah. he's not dumb. He I, that's why I think when it comes to the killing, he he knew what was going on completely. Yeah, he had an IQ of one hundred and twenty. Yeah, I mean, he was an upper five percent of the yeah. population in terms of intelligence. So, you know, yeah, this guy was definitely competent. Yeah, um, yeah. D- despite the escape, though, he was granted parole um, in nineteen sixty nine. Which is very weird with how this all works because he was sentenced nine to fi- six to fifteen years in nineteen sixty one, and then I don't know how he, he, he gets, gets off gets off like that. Yeah, I tried. Easy. I I did. I tried looking into Governor Milton Shap. It was very hard to find anything on this yeah, guy. No, probably for a good reason. He yeah, probably resigned and fell off the face of the earth. Yeah, after. that would be my guess. Very very weird. Yeah. Um, and then obviously, um, Banks. Start, he got a job at um being a security guard at a uh, prison in Camp Hill, which is actually by my house. It's pretty oh, interesting. Careful, you know? Yeah, you know, be kind of guys are putting Yeah, out there. <laughs> be a little careful up there. Um, but yeah, uh, weeks before uh, the murder spree, um, Banks was suspended from his prison guard duty after locking himself in a guard tower with a shotgun, claiming he was going to kill himself. Hmm. Um, later then, obviously, Banks was uh, placed on involuntary sick leave to see a... Um, Psychologist on September 29th, which we know obviously never happened. Because, yeah, the murders were on the 25th. So yes. he didn't quite make it to the he, um, yeah, Probably should have made that appointment a little earlier. Yeah, but maybe we wouldn't <laughs> have, maybe we'd have some of his family still alive. Yeah. What a shame. Okay, well, so he go, he, he's going to commit suicide. Several, but why? Yeah. Okay. I guess his background kind of tells a story, and that's kind of what happened when they were testifying, um, witnesses were testifying against him at his trial, saying that he was disturbed, he was paranoid. And this is because he grew up tormented by whites and blacks. He was the son of a black father and a white mother. Mm-hmm. So, you know, kids call him all kinds of derogatory names, half breed, zebra. You know, so this it had to I mean that's that's kind of what, what would happen. Yeah, you know, it's, being it's, being a victim of yeah. bullying and stuff like that. I mean, we even see that kind of thing happen today, where kids are being called fat and yeah. losers. And, and back yeah, then, with race racism, yeah, that being was a, still around. And yeah, this is the nineteen sixties, the nineteen fifties, like even being still Jim Crow era. Like, yeah, definitely. So still, it's not. It wasn't easy. Yeah, definitely. And not. you know, because of all this, he developed a persecution complex, started having paranoid delusions that there was going to be some sort of international race war and uprising. Okay, so we'll just get into what a persecution complex is. Okay, so that's, by definition, an irrational and obsessive feeling that is one of the one of the objects of collective hostility or ill treatment from others. So basically, 
you feel you're you be, you're victimized to a point where you feel like you're under attack, mm-hmm. under physical attack from these people. So it's like paranoia. Yeah. Constantly. Almost exactly. Yeah. So he claimed that he was preparing for a, for this race war. You know, he wrote a story of him and his sons sur- surviving the aftermath of a race war. Planned, he he purchased weapons. Okay, the R-15, I'm sure, was one of them. Yeah. Um, he planted food in the woods. So this was like some real deal stuff. Like he went into the woods and planted food. He thinks this, he thought this was coming soon. Yeah. You know? He was obviously getting prepared in for, every way possible yeah, for this. Including the murder. And he read all kinds of survivalist magazines. You know, so he was really trying to educate himself on this paranoid delusion that there was going to be some sort of uprising and he was going to be at the center of it. Definitely makes me think like with paranoia and probably some schizophrenia was in there. Yeah. That, maybe like... Uh, probably a whole host of... A bunch of things. Yeah, mental illness and all kinds of other stuff, right? Yeah. So, as a part of his insanity defense, he got three psychiatrists to agree that before, during, and after he was suffering from... Severe mental defects, paranoid psychosis, which is disconnection from reality, and paranoid delusions, which is a belief of altered reality based upon actual evidence of reality. Yeah. So you have this sense that there's going to be some uprising and you're going to do everything in your power to make sure that you're not affected by it. And I guess clearly to him, he's going to kill his whole family. Right. Not to poke fun at it, but it's kind of insane. Um, so, but I mean, again, I mentioned this before. Despite all that, he was a smart guy. Yeah, and, uh, and even when their psychiatrist said that he, um, when speaking with them, like for multiple occasions, would drape like a robe over himself, so like they couldn't see him like fidgeting or like at, at certain questions he was yeah. asked or. Certain things like that. They really believed he was truly a smart person, obviously, with draping, obviously. So, because psychiatrists are paying attention to everything you're doing, mm-hmm. your hand moving, your feet, if you're looking in certain areas, like f- testing for yeah, lies. Body language. Yeah, they're reading your body language the whole time. And for him to come in there and just take a blanket, a dro- yeah. robe drape, and drape it over his body, it just so they can't see those little tidbit things. He definitely wasn't dumb, and he knew. What yeah, and he seems to be covering all of his bases too, and you know, thinking about how is how is this going to affect me? You yeah. know, I guess not really in the rational sense, but he would. It seemed like he was planning his defense from the get go. Yeah, um, you know, hiding the weapon somewhere else, covering his body with the robe, mm-hmm. taking a a drug that would alter his ability to decision make taking which, Delanton which I mean if that was planned if, that, if he yeah. knew that already and this guy did his research with his IQ it's very possible I mean it's very possible you know, we see things like this nowadays even like but with people with an IQ like that back then maybe that was part of his whole thing maybe he wanted people to think that he was insane yeah he was insane and like that's the reason this all happened which actually goes back to why with his case he wasn't killed because of his yeah because of his his, his streamlined perfect insanity defense yeah. he, he well he could have crafted this himself yeah and definitely. He, did, he did a bang up job because he's still alive he's 30 yep. something years later 75 still kicking yep. on death row 75 years later yep in uh, Montgomery County in um a very high maximum prison. Well, yeah, I keep this guy locked up pretty good. Yeah. Right? So, all in all, doesn't really work too well. Not, not at the time. Okay. Yeah. He's convicted of murder and he's sentenced to, he's sentenced to death. But as the years go on and he sits on death row, he actually starts to deteriorate mm-hmm. to a point where. The whole insanity defense starts to actually line up with reality. Yeah. And the day he was supposed to be executed, he 
he gets off. Yeah. And he is still hanging out. Yeah, too mentally ill to execute his yeah. statement. So, that's all I have. Anything that's, Anything else that's worth talking about? Uh, that's really about it. Uh, I have other stuff like many um, failed attempts to kill himself. They didn't speak on exactly with in prison um, if he actually tried. Maximum security prison, very unlikely. I mean, he's probably checked on several times. He's probably in some sort of unit, I want to say, that's checked on every seven to eight minutes. Mm. You know, you see this with people who have those problems in prisons, always maybe, like, check, just checking to see if, like, obviously they're doing anything, like, smacking their head off the wall, Trying hanging escape. themselves, <laughs> escape, just things like that. He's probably definitely on a time frame, I want to say, being checked on constantly because of his constant attempts, especially with the guard tower mm-hmm. incident. Definitely want to say he's probably checked on quite often. Yeah. And, you know, not a lot of people know about this. You know, the, all the people that I've told that we were doing this on the World Spare shootings, they're yeah. like, oh, wait, did it happen yesterday? Yeah. Like, maybe, <laughs> but no. It happened in the 80s. Happened in the 80s. Wait. I feel like it, it's... It's not necessarily. It shouldn't be like praised as a as a piece of local history. Yeah. But, um, this isn't just like a college town. Like real real shit happens here. Yeah. This is. Uh, yeah. This is a, this is a good dose. Yeah. Of you know what could happen. It can happen anywhere. Yeah. I mean, for and some, for most yeah. people, this is their hometown. Yeah. People live around here and hardly even know about it. But. Yeah, definitely was an history, interesting topic to pick for this. Yeah. All right, so this is like primarily to inform people about this tragedy that <laughs> happened back in the 1980s, and that you know at this point in time it's been, I guess, sweeped under the rug. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sure like just like how the Zodiac caused chaos in the in California and maybe even across the country. Yeah. Back in this, back in the early 70s, this might have had the same effect just in this area. Wilkes-Barre, you know, Scranton, Hazleton, whatever. Yeah. But now, at this point, no one even knows about it. We don't even talk about it in class. And no, yeah, at all. I've had Dr. Wilzak quite a few times. We've He's never brought it up. Seems like something he would bring up, you know, learning about Wilkes-Barre. We talk about Wilkes-Barre all the time, you know, but never something that's been brought up and maybe to, like, inform him as well that this actually happened here. And he'll definitely get a kick out of it because yeah. it's Wilkes-Barre, but... Exactly. Because <laughs> this is, I mean... Similar things happen probably on a daily basis that we don't know about. Yeah. And I mean, not to this caliber, but. Yeah, for this to be where we chose to go to college. Yeah. And uh, one of the high, the highest, it is the highest killing spree to happen in Pennsylvania history. It was right here. Walking the same streets that he drove on. It's pretty. Uh, yeah. And that we get, it's not really unusual to get, you know, reports of somebody getting mugged or whatever. Actually, just yesterday, they, yeah. came, they got jumped They got it. jumped outside of one of the one of the housing. Yeah, guy had a gun and everything. Building. Yeah. Unreal. And, you know, I guess we're lucky to have good public safety. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to keep us safe and Look, whatever, but it's, it's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. Yeah. So you got to make sure if you know somebody... Maybe don't say or call out to them that you know them if they're carrying an AR-15 at yeah. 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Maybe just go about your business and maybe you can, you know, live to tell about that night. Live to tell about Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so that's a, that's a lesson to learn. Sure.